Hello everybody and welcome. I'm Daryl Karp. I'm the Director of the Museum of Australian Democracy here at Old Parliament House. And just a reminder before we get started to check your phones and if you're brave enough to turn them off and if not to turn them on to silence, please. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the first Australians on whose land we meet and whose cultures are among the oldest uh, continuing cultures in human history. And I particularly want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I want to acknowledge other Indigenous people in the room today. Joining us tonight, should I say joining us today, <laughs> it's been a long week of lots and lots of presentations. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge Professor Mick Dodson, uh, Director of the National Centre for Indigenous Studies at the ANU. John Stanhope, who's the former Chief Minister of the ACT, Professorial Fellow and Director of Public Engagement at Canberra University's Institute of Governance and Policy Analysis, or as we colloquially call them, IGPA. And Jack Waterford, journalist, commentator, and Canberra Times editor at large. Welcome, gentlemen. <laughs> For many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, this building is associated with much pain and sorrow. But key decisions in the fight for Indigenous rights were shaped by many of the debates, meetings and decisions that took place within these walls, as well as those protests that took place at the Tent Embassy and elsewhere in Australia. So I think it's particularly fitting that we're meeting today in this extraordinary members' dining room in Old Parliament House to explore a new philosophy for uh, dealing with Indigenous incarceration and justice reform. And we'll hear more about that shortly. Before, though, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jack Waterford, who began his career in journalism as a cadet with the Canberra Times in 1972. He was then appointed deputy editor in 1987, editor in 1995, and editor-in-chief in 2001. Jack is well known for his investigative journalism using freedom of information legislation and for his work and advocacy on Indigenous health issues. Jack was named a member of the Order of Australia in 2007's Australia Day Honours for service to journalism, particularly as a commentator on national politics, the law, raising debate on ethical issues and public sector accountability, and to the community in the area of Indigenous affairs. Also in that same year, he was named Canberra Citizen of the Year, and on presenting the award, ACT Chief Minister John Stanhope said, <laughs> Wardford was a champion of many causes and a leading figure in his trade. Please welcome me, please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Jack to the stage. I think that should be a bit better, yep. Um, in echoing the acknowledgements you've made of country and whatnot, I want to emphasize that we're not entirely speaking about indigenous problems, although it forms a very large part of, of what we are talking about today. But I thought I might introduce a little bit of that larger part by recalling a Canberra citizen that some of you may recall of about 30 years ago, or 50 to 30 years ago, by the name of Raymond O'Shaughnessy. Raymond, whom I very fondly remember, was a one-man crime wave of a particular sort. He didn't burgle people's houses. He didn't have a drug problem. He um, he was awfully fond of greyhounds and things like that, but I don't think he ever did anything illegal with them. But he had a strong sense of justice. He was at one stage the Secretary of the Trades and Labor Council, and he was always in strife in one way or another, and the way in which this strife would be manifested is he would go around to see the Director of Housing or the Director of this or the Director of that and camp in his office and the police would have to be called to remove him from the office and then he'd be taken down to the, uh, the cop shop and be required to sign the bail and the bail would ask him with the, he would agree not to go back to the office again he'd say no so he'd get carted off to Goulburn jail or whatever. Anyway, Raymond, Raymond uh, probably caused all by himself something like 20 or 30 million dollars of the protective security that we have around government offices 
in the ACT long before Al-Qaeda or Islamic State was even heard of. And he was always in trouble with the courts. And at one stage, he was in trouble with the Ombudsman. He was in trouble with the Director of Housing. He was in trouble with the Department of Industrial Relations and so forth like that. And they, they held a big conference about what are we going to do with this person. And the Director of the, the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police at that stage was a fellow called Major General Ron Gray. And he said, I recommend that what we do is that we get him a suite at the Lakeside Hotel and give him a couple of thousand dollars a week spending money. And everybody had their polite laugh and said, but what do you really think we should do? And he said, no, 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 I'm perfectly serious. This man is costing us many times that in all of the problems that, he, uh, that he's bringing on. And this is very much what justice reinvestment is all about. It's about the concatenation of factors that are making jail a fairly predictable outcome for all too many Australians, including Indigenous Australians. And it's about the concatenation of interventions that we could be making before jail arises as an, uh, as an option that will make jail less likely outcome. Now, there are all too many Australians, there are all too many Indigenous people who are spending all too much time in jail. I'm not arguing with the judges about whether people deserve it or not in a particular circumstance or whatnot. I'm raising the question now whether a spending of a slightly different order before, during people's childhood, <coughs> focus on education and on jobs and whatnot could make that jail something that was less inevitable. Now, today I'm not the expert on this subject. I'm raising some of these issues and I'm raising them not just in the course of the discussion that's been taking place here with the Indigenous um, National Indigenous Centre, but also in relation to programs that have got underway in Burke and in Sejuna and in Cowra, which I hope Mick will be describing to us, but also in terms of the question of whether the ACT, which should be a model of such sort of intervention programs, should go into this field, and if so, what they must do to go into it in a fair dinkum way. Now, in getting things going, I think we should start off first with Professor Mick Dodson, who's a member of the uh, Iyawaru people of the um, traditional Aboriginal owners of, of uh, thing in the Broome area. But he's, uh, and he's director of the National Centre for Indigenous Studies at the ANU and a professor of law at the ANU and a former, as all of you would know, um, Commissioner for Social Justice with the uh, um, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission. Mick, I wonder if you could start off by telling us a little bit about the program that you're engaged in, where it's going, and uh, what you, you think that uh, it might take us to. As Jack mentioned, I'm involved in a research project, um, the National Centre for Indigenous Studies, and a number of my colleagues and uh, from ANU and from other other places. Um, and we're working in Cowra. We've been there for um, this is our third year, um, looking at justice reinvestment. And again, as Jack indicated, the we're spending an inordinate amount of money on keeping people locked. Um, and uh, you know, it's, there is a view that uh, this is a waste of public money um, because there are many, many people uh, who ought not be locked up, uh, particularly for lower level uh, crime, for being poor and unable to pay fines and those sorts of reasons. We're not saying 
there aren't some people who need to be in prison to protect society. That's not what we're on about. There are, there are some bad people in society who we need to lock up. Um, but there are some people in prison that, um, and in um, are detained in youth centres that ought not be there. for lower level crime. What's happened with the, the ballooning of expenditure on corrections is that um, it's been taken off services that have generally been centralised. And the work we're doing in Cowra clearly indicates that because they've got to go to Dubbo or Bathurst or the Sydney to get services that were once um, available in the town. Um, <coughs> because the money's needed to build more prisons, to make available more beds, because the politicians are freaked about being soft on crime. You've done some work in Cowra, have you not, that actually attempts to quantify some of the, the cost to the community of, of crime in the community, of, of sustaining jails, etc. What, what yeah, yes, we have. I mean, what the community is. The, the idea is to get that money back yeah. to the community so the community can. Um, reclaim its citizens, if you like. Um, and um, I don't know the precise figures, but in the last 10 years, it's cost about, in a small town like Cowra, it's cost the taxpayers $25 million, something of that order, to put people away in Sydney or Dubbo or somewhere else. Um, and that's $2.5 million a year. Uh, that doesn't add anything to those people who are detained or imprisoned. Uh, doesn't add anything to the community. It actually takes the money out of the community. Um, the, the, the idea is that if people are there for low-level offences um, that ought not be there. Um, let's give that money back to the community so the community can deal with the problem. The community can uh, work out how to keep offenders out of trouble or to stop them offending um, and restore those uh, services and facilities um, and even make them grander, if you like. You know, it's, it's, it costs a lot of money to keep one person in prison. And, it, and it's about double for young people. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it's you know, upwards of $250,000, $300,000 a year. Hence Jack's anecdote. It would be cheaper to put them in at the lakeside um, and give them $1,000 a week to spend. Um, that's madness. <laughs> We need to do something about it because it's unsustainable. Um, we need to deal with this in a different way. Is our is our um, theory, if you like, of our, our research, and we're not actually implementing justice reinvestment in Cowra. We're testing the methodology and trying to get the community uh, to build a model around. And we've engaged the whole community in the process, and they've been wonderful. The Cowra people have been wonderful in. It's not that we haven't had a hiccup here and there, um, like all research you do, but they've embraced it and, and are very um, much on board with the, with the idea. Yeah. I don't really have to introduce John Stanhope except to remind people about how his entire political career and even quite a bit of his post-political career, if he can be said to be in that as yet, but has been focused around human rights issues. But while he was a politician, 
he was very much involved in and had to wrestle with the resources and the circumstances in which we created a jail in the ACT. And just the sort of juggle of costs and benefits and whatnot that we're sort of talking about now. I wonder, with the background of your experience in that, John, and thinking of this justice reinvestment thing, how you um, uh, see the current situation in the ACT? Thanks, Jack. Um, I'd like to, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today and to extend to them my respects. I'd like to, to acknowledge um, my colleagues at Wananga I uh, am an employee of Wananga uh, a proud employee. It's one of the most satisfying jobs I've had in my life. And I've learned a lot in the eight or nine months that I've been there. I acknowledge the significant number of my colleagues from Wananga that are here today, including um, uh, new friends I've made in the Wananga men's group, who many of whom have a particular insight into some of the issues that we're discussing. Um, I, I've reflected quite a bit on uh, the AMC and, uh, and and the prison and incarceration in the ACT. I did, of course, at the time that I drove the decision uh, that the ACT should accept full responsibility for those people from within our community that it was, through the criminal justice system, felt necessary to lock up. Um, and uh, I, I drove that, and I drove it uh, with a view that we here in the ACT could be trusted to do it better uh, than uh, any of the prisons interstate, most particularly New South Wales, to whom we at that time were transporting all of our prisoners. And Goulburn in particular. And Goulburn in particular, I think I, the closest to, to cl two closest prisons to the ACT, of course, were Goulburn and Cooma. Uh, and uh, I think I was mindful of the reputation of Goulburn rather than um, having had any uh, particular insight or personal experience of what it was. So I drove that decision, uh, having already introduced a Human Rights Act for the ACT and uh, I was very much motivated by some reading that I'd done around some of the experience from Europe, most particularly Norway. And I remember reading an article headed, um, Holden Prison, Norway, the most human rights compliant prison in the world. And I thought, oh, we could take that title. Um, and it was my aspiration, of course, for the AMC that one day I would read in the Sydney Morning Hill, the Canberra Times or the Guardian Alexander McConaughey Centre, the most human rights compliant in the world. And I'm still waiting, of course. Um, and, and there has been some controversy around the prison. Um, there's an issue, I'll just touch on it lightly because it's not necessarily all that relevant, about the size of the AMC. I brought the prison to a budget figure or prediction that I've been given by my officials. and. Uh, I, I got the quote, it was around, it was $128 million, and I said, guys, that's it, that's your quote, you know what we want. And then I said, finalise it, get, get it organised, and don't dare ask me for another cent. That's it, at that number, um, but of course they didn't. The number blew, as it tended to do, and they came back and said, oh, we need another 20 million bucks. I said, you can't have it. I said, I told you that. So we built the prison to a number, and uh, I think, as a consequence of my language and my expectation that uh, this be uh, you know, deliberately human rights compliant, that it be compliant, that it be client focused, that it be a healthy prison, that it put the prisoner first, uh, that I expected uh, the department and the corrections um, to actually then fulfil my expectations. And to some extent, as I look back, and the fact that we've just added another 56 cells and 80 beds. Um, it seems to me counterintuitive to a restorative justice philosophy or, or mind bent from within the ACT public service that you've got a prison, you've got a certain number of beds, you've got a government that is progressive and has demanded of its uh, public officials that they implement policies that reflect the government's expectation and you turn your back for a couple of years and all of a sudden there's an extra 80 beds which flies in the face of the entire conversation, I would have thought, of around justice reinvestment. Um, and it is interesting, I was told at the time, and I poo pooed it, I remember having earnest discussions, oh, John, you know if you build a prison here in the ACT, the courts will fill it. Uh, and at that time, we didn't. We had a very low per capita or pro rata uh, incarceration rate in the ACT. 
It's the fastest growing pro rata incarceration rate in Australia at the moment. And it's the fastest growing real increase in incarceration. You know, the ACT, there's a number of statistics in relation to Alexander McConaughey and the ACT that are ugly reading. We are increasing the pro rata rate of imprisonment faster than any other jurisdiction in Australia. Uh, we are increasing the real rate of imprisonment in the ACT faster than any other jurisdiction in Australia. It's starting from a low base, and that's how I, from a very low base. And for me, it's uh, somebody thinking that I was doing really great works in aspiring to develop the most human rights compliant prison in the world, of course there's a perversity that I have to deal with is that having built the prison, uh, we now see the ACT imprisoning Canberrans at a faster rate than other jurisdictions around Australia. And I might just touch on the Indigenous, uh, it's an issue that now I, now I think a lot about Indigenous issues these days and I've developed a level and degree of understanding that I have to say I didn't have when I was in politics which I wished now in retrospect that I did have. And uh, on our count, and our count, that is the Wananga Nimitiar count, the Wananga Nimitiar count on Aboriginal people in the AMC today suggests that almost 50% of the women in the AMC are Aboriginal women and that we believe 28% of the men in the Alexander McConaughey Centre are Aboriginal men. We are concerned that a number of Aboriginals are not declaring their Aboriginality uh, when they're admitted to the AMC, and I think there's an issue there for us to reflect on. But in the context of justice reinvestment, the other point I would make is that I think always intended that the AMC you know, would be a beacon of justice reinvestment. It was on that basis that I didn't blanch when the average daily cost of maintaining a prisoner in the ACT runs out at $100 a day more expensive than the rest of Australia. And I thought, well, there's justice reinvestment, starting with this massive investment uh, that the ACT government is providing. And of course, it's early days, it's a young prison, and I'm not up to date with the data. But I would, I'm very interested in seeing whether that incredibly enhanced level of investment in each prisoner each day is paying dividends over and above the dividends that are being delivered and I would have thought it's a prime measure or a prime indicator of justice reinvestment. How much are you spending to start within your prison on each prisoner? Now John, a major issue about justice reinvestment of course is not having people in jail in the first place because they've been, if you like, diverted out of the system. But a subsidiary issue, of course, is that people who have got to jail are not then becoming entrenched as a part of a jail population or institutionalised and so forth. And that's in part a function of the programs that you run in jail, whether for occupying people, giving them things to do, providing them with deficiencies in their education and whatnot. What do you hear about the AMC in relation to that? Um, well. I think the, the first challenge for all of us is to better understand why it is that Canberrans, this most prosperous city in the world, um, are still being incarcerated at the rates they are, and most particularly um, Aboriginal Canberrans. You know, why is it that from a base population of 1.7% Aboriginal people within this community, 28% uh, of the people that we incarcerate? That's the numbers. There are 6,000 Aboriginal people in Canberra, 1.7% of our population. And yet that 1.7% of our people produced 28% of the people that we, um, through our systems, lock up. Um, so I think we need far greater attention to those determinants that actually have led to that offending in the first place. And we all know what they are in relation to you know, the, uh, the childhood, the early life, the difficulties at school, non-completion non of school. Uh, difficulties in obtaining employment as a whole result of all of those collective things, then the intergenerational trauma, the depression, the mental illness, the drug and substance abuse, and then imprisonment, and then of course um, recidivism. recidivism. And uh, th they're the issues. So if I had an extra $5 million today through a justice reinvestment program, I would go to Julie Tong's and I would ask her to employ an additional 50 social health workers and case manage the families that we know um, 
will produce the next generation of criminals. We know, we almost know who they are. My father was a school teacher and I never forget a conversation with him 35 years ago and he said to me, I can, I can tell you by the time a child is in year four whether or not they'll go to prison or the juvenile detention. And I think, you know, we haven't learned from these things. But I talked to some of the clients of Wananga Nimitiyar that have uh, spent time in the Alexander McConaughey Centre and I say, oh, what it was like, and they say to me it was boring, there was not enough to do, there's no jobs, you can't earn money. Um, the transitional release jobs into the community, which was always a primary expectation of me, that people, when they left, the prison would already have a job, uh, has not occurred to a degree that I think is, uh, is necessary. So some of the feedback I get, and I would urge uh, those that are doing, looking at the Justice Reinvestment Trial to talk closely to Aboriginal people uh, and their experiences and what it is that they, that they need. Just picking up on that, I'm sure you would agree that you can, in a Cowra or a Berg or a Sejuna or whatnot, pretty much pick, or a Canberra, pretty much pick the kids who were candidates for prison. Now we're looking, I think, all around at about a $4 billion a year that's being spent one way or another on the justice system when you add in the cost of the corrective system on top of the police, etc. And about one billion of that is essentially going on Aboriginal prisoners or Aboriginal people in, uh, in encounters with the system. What are some of the sorts of interventions that you could imagine that might make a drastic difference to that predictive capacity? You're asking me that? Yeah. Question. I um, know you're in I'll, research I'll, on the subject, but straight off the top. I was um, enjoying John talking, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, um, you know, we asked, we went and asked people what they think the money should be spent on. Um, and that's where you, now this is a, in a sense, a project that's in part founded on community development principles. So I think that I have a strong view that um, the people who have the problem ought to be given the opportunity to solve the problem. Um, and we ought to put resources into that. And that that that, that um, applies to any community. It doesn't have to be an indigenous community. But if you strip resources and facilities and services out of a community, of course they're going to have trouble uh, keeping kids out of trouble. Um, or adult offenders. Um, so we went and asked people, and we asked kids, we asked we had the police, we had the federal and state services, um, bureaucratic um, arms, and we asked the Aboriginal people, of course. Um, we asked the hospital, the, the um, schools, every, you know, we got a, a broad range of people involved in the project and we asked them what ought to happen. We didn't suggest that. Yeah. Um, we thought it should be for the community to tell us what would help. And that's what I think we have to do because you get reactive politicians making decisions from afar and that gets sent down through the bureaucracy and then services tend to disappear um, because some shock jock has said you're too soft on crime or for some other ridiculous reason that really has nothing to do with dealing with um, the issues or the problems that we're now confronted with. And, uh, you know, if, if we went out to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Australia and said, here, look, there's an extra billion dollars. I'm sure they'd come up with myriad good ideas as to how to spend that. So I wonder if one of the things that kids complained about in Cowra is there's no cinema. There's nowhere to go. Um, and there's not, apart from some sporting clubs, there's not 
much happening outside of um, school for them. You know. So they wanted a cinema built. Um, so they got somewhere to go. They wanted, you know, safe houses. They wanted um, shelter. They wanted uh, the local businesses to you know, give the younger people some opportunities to work while they were at school and those sorts of things. And, and boredom seems to be one of the drivers of, of bad behaviour. Um, so my answer to your question is, well, ask the bloody community, they should, they'll tell you what they want. I had one anecdote to that. Sometimes I wonder whether or not police boredom is a part of the problem as well. I'm thinking of a, a community but this could just be a typical one called Yundamu, which is about 200 miles west of Alice Springs. But it was one of the communities which, as a result of the, the intervention of seven years ago, was given WACO uh, a whole array of more policemen, some of whom came from the ACT, I might add, and a $7 million police station. Now, I think there were, in fact, more police needed in the community, and the community actually wanted that. But the very fact of there being more police in the community almost entirely dealt with the problem that there was there. People didn't want the police rushing around arresting people. They wanted police in the community so that if trouble developed, there could be interventions and usually at a fairly low scale. And believe you me, the police generally in many of these communities are reasonably tolerant and inclined to keep the peace. But the problem that then developed was that there was hardly anything happening that would justify such a large police presence. And so, so as to justify their existence, the police began then doing snap checks on whether everybody had their current driver's licence or whether the vehicle was registered or whether they paid any of their fines. And about, I'm not joking, about a tenth of the Yundamu community is currently behind bars for non-payment of fines or for, for driving motor vehicles uh, while the vehicles are unregistered. Not in town or anything like that, but just around the local community itself, hunting them, etc. And yeah. I wonder whether or not... Well, no, nobody in the end of before the intervention got speeding fines. Yeah. Post the intervention, they put up speeding signs. Yes. So people are getting booked for speeding. Yes. Now, it's this. And is it a good way, if you like, of what's the word, coercing a community into being um, more tolerant? Well, coercion's not going to work. No. I mean, the, co coercion doesn't work anywhere, really. Um, it's not. It's not the way to tackle a whole range of issues, and, and particularly in business affairs, because people just disengage, and that's what's happened in the intervention. Because it's seen as white fella stuff. This is what they want to do. It's not what we want to do. And in fact, they haven't even asked us. They've just imposed this on us. And, um, now, John, it doesn't work. One of the problems that has arisen in all of this context, and Mick has touched on this, has been, if you like, the effect of the job, the shock jocks, or the need for politicians to be seen as tough on crime or not uh, lily-livered or to not have jails that are going to be described in the Daily Telegraph as air-conditioned motels or whatnot. Um, in some parts of the world, this sort of tendency has, has been, if you like, a conservative, somewhat right-wing tendency. But we've seen in both Australia and in England people that you might describe as a broadly small L liberal bent thinking of Tony Blair in particular who, and, and of Bob Carr in New South Wales, both of whom supervised a long era of politics in which the jail populations, in one case of the United Kingdom and in another case of um, uh, New South Wales, uh, increased by something like a figure of 150%. <coughs> now, what's happening with our politicians that, uh, that they are falling so much into that rut. Well, it's a, it's it's about it's just raw politics, I guess. Yes, it's uh, 
I think, uh, I must say, I think in the ACT, the ACT, the current, the ACT government, to be fair, has held a line reasonably well on law and order and terrorism related um, scare campaigns, etc., etc., and uh, the rush to the rush to ignore the rule of law and to simply um, ignore some fairly basic human rights. Uh, I think uh, the Labor Party, um, I'm a member of the Labor Party, I should declare that. Um, the Labor Party, I think, has been reasonably good on law and order issues, uh, as distinct from its the same sentiment or role that it's played in relation to the asylum seeker debate, where, um, the, where the Labor Party has certainly and joined in the, the rush to the populist bottom in relation to its attitude and its language around asylum seekers. And to some extent, it's just an extension of the language that uh, is used, driven by perceptions of uh, the community's expectation that uh, criminals will be punished, the, the desire for retribution, the need for revenge, uh, all of the things that the criminal justice system um, pretends that it's not there for, but the community has very high expectations. And, and it's very difficult, I think, as a politician, you know, in relation to a heinous crime affecting a family and to see the family on the television crying and distraught, understandably, at a daughter that's been lost through a rape and murder, for instance. It's incredibly hard as a politician to stand up and defend uh, a particular sentence when the family is crying uh, for a harsher sentence or even for the death penalty. It's tough, but I think it is just a question of character, really, and the need to respect the rule of law and why we have it. But, uh, it, it, but it is difficult. There are, and, um, that it's, and, and I think, and I don't want to, I, I'm conscious that whilst 25 to 28% of prisoners across Australia are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, 75% aren't. So it's a, it's, there's an issue, of course, for uh, the white um, community that produces, from, from whom uh, I think a majority of criminals are produced for us not to generalise, but I think the other issue in relation to Aboriginal incarceration has to be around race. There's some quite recent research that's been done that by an academic at Deakin University which suggests that on 400, I think, thousand sentences that he reviewed in relation to cases where the, the, the identity of the offender could be, was actually ascertained to be Aboriginal, that they were twice as likely to be imprisoned for the same offence. And you, you can't not assume that there's still some colour blindness in relation to, to justice and the way in which it's implemented. So I think there are, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But, uh, but it's hard, but it's, we expect our governments not, not to fall into those traps. Having said that, and I might just add this because it's something that I'm must say I'm not particularly familiar with, but I've just seen recently in the paper a debate about whether or not random drug tests undertaken at the Alexander McConaughey Centre um, should be introduced. And I've seen it even explained in some formal way that the, uh, the implementation of the, the random testing is in order to, in, to, to actually assist in the imposition of penalties uh, for those within side the AMC that are accessing drugs and using them and failing random breath tests. And if that's not punitive, uh, and contrary, I think, to what I would have thought. Though I should hasten to add, I'm not all that familiar with the policy, but as I understand it, the AMC proposes to introduce broad random um, drug tests, or just like breath tests, drug tests, and, uh, and that, the, and that the, the outcomes of those drug tests will lead to some punitive outcome, which I assume will then impact on uh, the potential release date of uh, a person that's punished as a result of taking a substance which the prison authorities, for whatever reason, were unable to prevent uh, being introduced into the prison in the first place. So I'm interested in a punitive outcome for prisoners that are revealed to have consumed an illicit substance, but I'm not sure that there's any punitive, out punitive outcome for those officials at the AMC who let the drug in in the first place. I hope they're not on performance payments. Well, of course, whenever anybody suggests that there are only so many tennis balls that are thrown <laughs> into the AMC fence and that possibly the staff have something to do with the introduction of some of the drugs, the heavens fall upon us. Yes, I'd never suggest that. Um, is there any comments or questions from the floor? Um, we 
seem to get a, a big response when John suggested that if he had an extra five million bucks, he knew exactly what to do with it, and there's a good response around. So the question is, what have we got to do to get the extra five million bucks? What is it that's going to alter the position of our politicians from <coughs> short-term uh, lock them up type response to long-term thinking? Well, well, well uh, uh, I guess we're, as with everything, there's uh, a need to establish, uh, it's, well, I guess initially need to establish the need and uh, what, the, uh, what the, the potential outcomes of such an investment might be. I have to say, and uh, you know, I can be accused of lacking some objectivity as an employee of Wununga, I acknowledge that, um, but from what I've observed and what I've seen and, uh, and of understandings that I've developed in relation to the circumstances of some Aboriginal families within the ACT, I cannot believe that that should be the, 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 the first step in seeking, in a justice reinvestment sense, the first step in seeking to reduce offending from within the Aboriginal community, and I can't believe it would be different in relation to an identifiable class of non-Indigenous people from whom, uh, from whom you know, potential uh, offenders come, that uh, greater involvement in their, in 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 their, in in meeting their needs would not um, result in better outcomes. Yeah, you know, there are some very worrying. Yeah, you know, we we pride ourselves, and we justly can. Canberra's a wonderful city. Um, and we've got a lot to be proud of. But we have an underclass that most of us uh, have no interaction with. There are 6,000 Aboriginal people in Canberra. Uh, I would suggest a significant proportion of them, whilst acknowledging that many Aboriginal people in Canberra have happily joined the middle class and hold down stable jobs and, um, and, and, and uh, have, no have no contact with the criminal justice system, there's a significant cohort of um, Aboriginal people and families here that live in dire in, uh, in dire circumstances, and they need more more support. And um, you know, from that same base population of um, of 1.7 percent, 25 percent of all children in care and protection in the ACT are Aboriginal children. You know, coming from around about 75 families, you know, we know who they are. Wananga, and this is my point. Wananga Nimiriyar deals with all of those families, those 70 families, probably every day of the week but with very limited resources. And having regard to their full range of sort of social indicators or social determinants, you know, we can touch on some, but we can't provide holistic care. Uh, this issue, I distracted or digressed, but I saw the numbers in the last Closing the Gap report. The ACT, which should be the exemplar, on average, an Aboriginal child in year 10 in the ACT misses three days of school a week. I can't believe that can't be fixed. I can't believe that there's not some way through uh, dedicated social health type workers. If you can't get an Aboriginal kid to go to school every day, when you get them to year 10 and you get them there seven days a week, why can't you get them there uh, seven days a fortnight? Why can't you get them there 10 days a fortnight? And if you're getting through year 10 on only seven days attendance out of every fortnight, I don't think you're going to get a TR at the end of year 12, even if you get to year 12. So we're making great strides. And I acknowledge that. We're making great strides uh, in the education of Indigenous kids. But I talk to people around Wananga Nimitia, people from the Aboriginal community, and there, are, there is still a major issue in the transition from primary school to high school. There are still significant numbers of Aboriginal kids start wagging school the minute they get to year seven. Because they're behind, they become embarrassed, uh, they, that someone level become shamed that they can't keep up with their homework. They feel ostracised, and they drop out, and then we know where they go. Can I just add to that, and agreeing with what John says about an underclass problem, and the fact that we, if you like, as a middle class community, don't really appreciate so much how that is. But <coughs> we know more or less about 150 non-Indigenous families who are in pretty much the same sort of circumstances. If, if you were if there were an active intervention program, you would you would be able to sop up about 90% of the what you might call crimogenic, poverty-genic community fairly quickly. And you don't it's not a close science. You could ask almost any 
policeman who walks the street, although there are all too few policemen who walk the street these days. Um, and, and, you know, the families can be nominated and talked about. Um, in many cases, uh, you don't have to do very much more than uh, read the court reports of the Canberra Bar. Thank you. Yes. Julie, Julie was going to... Okay. Um, <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional, traditional owners, and um, pay my respects to both elders past and present. Um, I find it very interesting, and um, as the CEO of Wanunga, we work with 74% of the ACT Aboriginal community, and uh, we do have some real problems in this community. But uh, when Unger went into Goulburn Jail for 10 years before Alexander McConaughey opened, and we also went to Cooma Jail when it reopened. So we've been in the prison system for a very long time. We developed, <laughs> we, we, we developed the model for healthcare in the prison um, before it even opened, but it was never ever picked up. Our model could be used for the whole prison what we want is to make sure that our young people are getting cultural support around identity and uh, other issues. Health's health, regardless of whether you're black, white or brindle. Health is health. Everybody is entitled to proper health care. John and I met with the Chief Magistrate, Lorraine Walker, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, she wanted to talk to us about options for our people instead of sending them to prison. And uh, she said, because every Aboriginal offender that goes before the court actually speaks highly of Wanunga and that Wanunga's supporting them. We are supporting not only the prisoners, but we're supporting their families on the outside. So Wanunga is more than a health service. We're a comprehensive primary health care service. A lot of our people shouldn't be in jail. They're in there because they've got mental health issues, they've got drug or alcohol issues. They should be getting proper health care. Until we address all the underlying causes, we're still going to end up with a prison full of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's up to us as a community to stop that. And, you know, regardless, all people are entitled to proper health care. When you go to prison, you lose your right to Medicare. So you don't have a choice of provider. And I know when I commenced work at Wanunga 18 years ago, I had the biggest arguments with, uh, with James Ryan, who was the head of corrections at the time, about Wanunga going into Bell Connor Remand Centre and providing a clinic for our Aboriginal inmates because they were there. They were already our clients on the outside. So why wouldn't we want to follow that journey? And that's what we do at Wanunga. So we're more than just a health service. We do everything Aboriginal at Wanunga. We have a social health team that supports all these um, people, regardless of whether you're on the inside or the outside, and working with families. I just feel really disappointed that, you know, we don't get any funding, funding from the Community Services Department to work with these families or these um, people. All our funding is health funding and self-generated income. So, you know, I think it's time for people in the room to take a really good, um, you know, to have a really good think about what effort you want to put into if you're serious about justice reinvestment, then you need to come to talk to me and our men's group and others in this room if we're really going to make a difference. Thanks. Just echoing that, Julie, I might remind you that when the first Aboriginal Medical Service was established in Australia at Redfern in, I think, 1972, the very first employee that it had was Shirley Smith, Mum Shirl, and her first and most dedicated thing, for which she became quite famous, although she'd been doing it for years beforehand, was visiting the jails. Yeah. My name is Rodney Bloxham. I'm an ex-prisoner. I was in the AMC. Um, what you need to reinvest in is um, 
like, they need places to stay, you know what I mean? They need accommodation. They need jobs and supervision, you know what I mean? That's why people need to keep them out of jail. You know, that's something in life, man, because they've got nothing. You know, if you get them into accommodation with supervised people, that's going to, you know, on a job, that's what they need. Thanks, Rodney. Could I just make a comment? Yeah. My name is Harry Rogers, and Carter has a very strong history. And the thing with me is, because of their colour, because of their colour, their targets, and that they're a statistic. And what I'm getting at is, if when I've asked for support for them, I've either had they've either had to commit a crime to be in the system. So there's no prevention whatsoever. And that's right across the board from their schooling, like they go to school, but there are issues at school. And I'll tell you why they're not going to year 10 is because of racism. It's blatant racism that they're not going. They get to year seven, they're going to school, no worries. And when they get to year eight, they're told they can't do this, they can't do that, they can't be like this, and they're adults at home. They're looking after parents and grandparents before they get there. And they're told they can't be treated like that at school. They can't talk to them. And teachers are saying, you've got to respect me, yet they're not respecting them as individuals. That's why they're getting into statistics of the racism at, at AMC or wherever. Um, thank you. How's that? Is that working? <laughs> Wrong end of the instrument. Um, there, there's a couple of things, including um, what um, the last um, intervention um, raised, but um, the centre I uh, direct at the ANU, National Centre for Indigenous Studies, uh, interestingly, we have another project we're about to begin. Um, and it's called, in shorthand. It's an Australian Research Council funded uh, project over three years, I think. Um, and it's called Deficit Discourse. And we're looking at what happens in schools. Uh, we're looking at this discourse where teachers, students, anybody else working in the education system, administrators, bureaucrats, what have you, even politicians, have this constant narrative about how deficient Aboriginal kids are and Aboriginal people generally. Um, and it's a, it's a subtle form of racism. Um, and we're looking at schools. in the um, Northern Territory, in Queensland, um, in Victoria, and I think there's one in the ACT, I'm not sure. But we're going to examine this question of, uh, that I think provides some explanation to why um, attendance is down when kids get to, by the time they get to year 10. But there's also a difficulty at the other end, you know, in, in in preschool, kindergarten, and, and year one, attendance is a problem. A lot of that is around economic and social issues. There's been some research um, done uh, around that, in particularly in East Perth, a few years ago. Um, but the other question that needs to be asked, and, and you've raised the issue, um, is, you know, the, what's the school? offering these kids, except a one-size-fits-all. Um, and 
you know, kids have to come from somewhere. They've, all kids come from somewhere through education. And if that's not respected, um, they're not going to succeed. Uh, and that happens too much around the country. And, and schools get closed or kids, you know, there's a, the great saviour among some of the common charities that boarding school's the answer. I went to boarding school for six bloody years, you know. It's a tough place and it's not a place for everybody. And it ruins people, it destroys them. They never get over it. I've got mates that I was at boarding school with 40 odd years ago. You know, who still haven't recovered. Um, and those who sing the praises of boarding school um, ought to do it with a great deal of uh, caution, caution uh, with a great deal of caution. Um, the other issue about uh, the Julie raised around um, you know, lack of funding for, I think in the last 10 years, ACTs, uh, through lack of funding or the withdrawal of funding have gone from nine support organisations down to three, and Wanunga is one of them, um, because government just withdraw, withdraws the money. Uh, perhaps they needed to put into prisons. Um, I don't know, but in the last two years, or the last two budgets in Australia, under the, I won't blame Mr Turnbull, but under Mr Abbott uh, and the former Treasurer, roughly $750 million has been taken out of the Aboriginal Affairs budget. And organisations across the country have closed down who try and keep people out of... Some of them try to keep people out of prison. Some of them try to help those when they're released to get a job, get somewhere to stay, brother. You know. um, and this is what the people in Cowra are saying to us. It's bloody hard to get a job when you've got a criminal record. You need support back in the community. You need somewhere to stay to start with. Um, and you need, you know, you need to be job ready, or have an opportunity to get job ready when you get out. Um, all of these things that get compounded by ripping out services and sending people, people away. There was, there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about, but I can't remember what it was, in response to what's been said so far. But I'll shut up now, Jack. I don't know whether any of you know, this couldn't possibly happen in Australia or not, but there's a generic joke amongst um, Afro-American people of the, the existence of a criminal fence in, in the uh, United States called DWB, driving while black. <laughs> <laughs> because despite vehement police denials of anything in the nature of racial profiling or anything like that, the fact is that if you're a driver, if you're a uh, Afro-American person driving a vehicle, the chance of you being, quote, randomly stopped by police is about 30 or 40 times what it is um, than if you weren't. I sometimes suffer from this thing myself. I went through airport security again today, and as on every occasion of about the last 30, I was one of the persons taken aside. <laughs> and asked to have be sniffed for gunpowder or something like that. I'm not quite sure why I look like such a potential terrorist, but however vehemently it's denied that, um, that I look like one or that I, they, the claim is this thing, it's getting beyond the coincidence. I was just thinking what Nick said there about going to boarding schools and whatnot. I had eight years of boarding schools. And there's something about boarding schools and institutions. If you've been in one institution, whether it's a children's home or a jail or the army or a boarding school, it marks you. It doesn't necessarily uh, drag you down. Some people benefit, some people don't or anything like that, but you always survive. I ran into an old friend of mine once and he said, oh, Jack, how are you? And I, 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 we sort of chatted for a while and he said, what are you doing here? And there was a school reunion. I said, what do you mean? He said, you didn't go to that school. I said, of course I did. What do you think? And he said, uh, you know, straight after 
I left school, I went into the army and I was in Vietnam. And then I got demobilised and a week after I was demobilised I got caught in the cross with seven pounds of dope. And I did seven years in Long Bay. He said, I always thought I met you. <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody over here. Yep. Uh, right. professor, uh, professor Dodden, I was wondering if you could comment, I'm conscious of time, but comment on signs of progress that we're making in the ACT towards implementing a justice reinvestment approach? Yep. Signs of progress. No, yeah, exactly. Signs of progress that we're making in the ACT towards having a justice reinvestment approach here. Well, I think the, um, the sign of progress is a deliberate decision by the ACT government, which has uh, been funded uh, to, to, to develop um, a basis from which to pursue a justice, a, a justice reinvestment strategy in the ACT. There is a clear political commitment political commitments are always clear when they're funded, uh, which has some funding uh, for a trial. And I think in relation to justice reinvestment, it is very important um, to think, I think, very clearly and rigorous, rigorously about what you're doing, the data you need, uh, how you're going to measure it. There's a whole range of issues that need to be taken into account. I think intuitively or instinctively, I know, I said I know what I would do. I would fund Wenunganimity are, but that's an instinctive response. And uh, I think if we are to engage seriously with justice reinvestment, um, then we do need to um, take some serious, to do some serious thinking. I guess what I would ask as an advocate or an employee of Wananga Nimiriya, but interested generally in corrections, is that there be genuine consultation and engagement. Um, I, I'll say it here now because I believe it clearly that um, th there is not nearly enough engagement with the ACT government with with Aboriginal people at the coalface within the ACT. Um, and uh, I'm concerned that that extends, um, or I'm concerned that that not extend to the consideration or deliberations that are currently underway in relation to justice reinvestment. But to give the ACT government credit, um, there are very strong indications that the ACT government is genuinely interested in pursuing justice reinvestment. I think it's a I think, I think it's only government in Australia, really, that has put the money where their mouth is. Oh, I don't, so yeah, speak, I don't yeah. know enough. Because I don't but, uh, know of any other jurisdiction has done um, but, um, this. Mm. Can I just go back to something, Jack, that I remember now. I said there was one thing I didn't remember about starting this off. You know, it necessarily has to be financially funded, front-end loaded, um, because you can't just rip the money out of the prison those in prison have to have support. So it's not, it, it becomes unattractive to politicians because you're going to put the money up front and gradually claw it back from the prisons. And once you get those low level offenders out of the system or get a lot of the kids out of the system. You know, it costs double the amount to keep a kid than it does an adult locked up. Um, sounds counterintuitive, but that's partly because the kids are going to be provided education. Um, but the argument for the politicians ought to be, in the end, if, if you could get them to think beyond the next election, um, is that you're going to save a swag of money here. Uh, it's not going to happen in the first five, ten years, you know, because you're going to have to undo all this stuff and claw the money back, and meanwhile you have to have to put the money into into re-establishing the services and facilities that are required for the community to, to take back their citizens. There's one other aspect that's worth bearing in mind as well. When we talk about imprisonment rates and so forth, you would be wrong to think that there's a close relationship between crime rates and imprisonment rates. There is probably an association between imprisonment rates and the amount of time Ray Hadley and Alan Jones and the Daily Telegraph rant on about the subject. But the overall level of crime in the community is generally falling, even as not only is the imprisonment rate increasing, 
but the length of time that people are serving in jail is increasing. Um, so the fear that some people might have that doing something about justice reinvestment or doing something that is focused on the families and the circumstances and whatnot is somehow going to let loose mass murderers or something like that into the community is actually tosh. We're dealing with perceptions here, not facts about a rising level of crime which needs to be curbed or some message sent or anything like that. All of that largely is bullshit. Seems like a good note. Seems like a good note on which to end it. Can you join me please in thanking our three extraordinary guests, Mick Dodson, John Stanhope and Jack Waterford for joining us. I'd today. like to have one just just to let on in a some information in regards to um, Channel 7, actually. Um, sorry, but I did have my hand up earlier, darling. Okay. Um, in, in regards to Channel 7, um, look, I was, I've been a public servant since I was 19 years old. I went through the 50s, uh, 60s, um, and I was a public servant a baby and whatnot. So when it comes to racism and institutional racism, when you've got one black person working out in a system of white people, you know, I adjusted to that. It's just that they had to adjust to me. But when it comes to funds for medical centres, um, social justice mob, you know, um, child protection and, and things like that, I, I don't know if everybody knows it, but Channel 7 actually has waged a war on the uh, federal government, Australian federal government, over the last 10 years. Okay? I'm for, sorry, in, for information, for information in regards to Aboriginal funding, Aboriginal funding and the outcomes of Aboriginal funding since um, we first got it in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay? Can I, can I just that was done three, this? please, that was done three years ago. That, and I've never heard anything else on it, anything else on it. So it's there in black and white, but no one in the public arena actually knows anything about it. So I just want to put it out there that it's there. You can get all the results from, um, from um, Aboriginal funding from day one and the outcomes on it. But the federal government and Channel 7 will not will not let it be known. Channel 9 won't let it be known either because they took my thing status down off Facebook uh, three weeks ago when I questioned it. Okay, now thank you very much. I've had my say. Thank you, I was just going to say. I'm sure all of us would be happy to talk to you outside uh, after this particular event and see if there's anything more that we can um, add to that. Thank you all very much for joining us. I know we have run slightly uh, late and thank you for IGPA and University of Canberra for setting all of this up. Thanks. Thank you.